The tree, so a tree that's been attacked by bark beetles rots differently and over a different time scale than a tree that is, say, charred by a wildfire. And depending upon the plants or animals, that may influence whether they're able to use it or not. Uh, this is the uh, uh, point I tried to make earlier. Forests do not recover from uh, fire. In, in a way, it's like saying they're recovering from snowfall or, or the tropical rainforest is recovering from rain. You know, this is what they need. Uh, many species are recovering from green forests. This is sort of flipping things on its, on its backside uh, and the opposite. So forest management impoverishes forest ecosystem. Here's another sanitized forest. Uh, note the afternoon stands are down wood here. And the snack forest that results from, whether it's beetles or fires in particular, is one of the rarest habitats in the West. If you're a species that depends on this habitat, it doesn't last very long because the trees tend to grow back over time, or, or the vegetation grows back. And so, they, and the trees and snacks will fall down and whatever. And so your, uh, your habitat is, is lost. And as a result, biodiversity is second highest in places with severe burns. Um, and that's sort of the, again, opposite of the way we would think. You know, you always hear the fire destroyed so many acres or whatever. Well, actually, it's created a bunch of habitat for species that really need it. For example, two-thirds of all wildlife species depend on dead trees at some point in their life. It could be uh, a fallen log on the ground, that salamander hides under, it could be where bulls go, it could be, uh, uh, it could be like uh, uh, insects. 45% of all bird species in the West depend on dead trees. So you cannot, if you love birds, you cannot be against having large wildfires or bark beetles or something because a lot of these species depend on that. Um, some are very specialized. So we have evolutionary evidence that large stand replacement fires are not abnormal. We would not have the evolution of species like the black backed woodpecker if it were so uncommon. Uh, they specialize in bird forests, that's why they have black bats. Or you have things like the martin. I remember reading about one study up in Wyoming, uh, probably a little colder than here, but anyway, the martin are a long, thin, weasel-like animal. And in Wyoming and Montana and places like that where they have extremely cold winters, uh, you will not find martin living any place where there are not a lot of rotten, down logs because they burrow into the dead log snags and use that during cold periods. And they might only use it for one week in a whole winter, but if it isn't part of their habitat, there's no martin there. So um, this kind of down wood is critical to, to the martin. Fallen logs create ha nest habitat for bees. Bees are you know, major pollinators in the forest, as well as for domestic, our native bee. And um, I read a recent article that said that um, 1,200 species of native bees depend on down logs for their habitat. And uh, in fact, I have a little, I took it because you want to do something really cool. I got a little two by four and drilled a lot of holes in it and put it up in my yard. And I got all these native bees that are overwintering. They, 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 they burrow in there and put their larvae in there. And then I watch them in the spring and all the holes get opened up because they're in there and they come out in the springtime. But anyway, they, uh, one study just came out and said that Native bees are most abundant in high severity burn areas. Um, down logs are a major home for ants, and ants are the most abundant in bird in the forest. And they do all kinds of things, like for example, some of the plants out there have special seeds that are attractive to ants, like trillium. And the ants gather the seeds and then plant them and help assist the uh, planting of those things. So the ants will also uh, uh, protect plants and shrubs from other insects. And, um, a lot of bears in some parts of the world uh, depend on ants for 50% of their food in the summer months, uh, when, especially when uh, berries are not around. I was walking through Yellowstone a couple of summers ago, and, and there had been a place where it was going to look like the forest had burned maybe 60 years before, judging by the size of the trees. And there's all these dead logs on the ground, every one of them torn apart by a grizzly bear looking for ants. And who would have thought, you know, 50 or 60 years before when that burned, that this was creating habitat for and food for grizzly bears in the future. 43% um, of all lichens out of 1,200 species in the Pacific Northwest are found on dead trees. And 10% are only found on dead trees. That's the only place they're found. Again, another evolutionary uh, evidence for uh, the adaptation of dead, dead trees. And why is this important? Well, lichens 
take nitrogen from the air, fix it, and when the rain drips through it, that, and that fixed nitrogen gets into the soil and improves plant growth. Fallen logs provide stream bank structural support, slowing erosion of stream banks. And then, they're really important for fisheries. Uh, there's been all kinds of studies showing that um, the, the down wood is some of the most important and critical element in, in fisheries, and there's no limit to you know, how much wood you can get in the stream. In other words, the more wood, the better for fish and other things, insects and so forth. And uh, interesting, it goes beyond just the fish. Uh, because this is good habitat for insects, some studies, one, a couple done in the river and overturned wilderness showed that there was more birds and bats in the streams above burnt streams because of all the insects that were created by the down logs in the stream. So uh, it, it goes ratchets up all the way through the ecosystem. Dead trees provide hiding cover for hundred species. So for example, uh, I had to have my friend move around here but I, so I could even see him. But if I were a hunter and this was an elk out here, he could hide pretty well in this dead trees here without me seeing them. So it provides more cover, at least till they fall over. And then rotten logs account for 30% of all nitrogen in parks. And some this is a small thing, but this is in Yellowstone where Historically, there was heavy browsing by elk, and the aspen were having some trouble regenerating when these logs fell down and made a fence that protected the aspen growth. And if you come back here 100 years from now, there'll be a bunch of aspen here. These logs will be rotted out by then. And you'll say, gosh, it's, I wonder why there's an aspen grove right here. Well, this might be the reason why. So uh, another is carbon storage. Any more, particularly in the uh, uh, climate change era, uh, there have been a number of studies that found that fuel treatments itself produce carbon emissions and the untreated stands stored more carbon than the treated stands even after a wildfire. Well, this, again, is counterintuitive, but it isn't. If you think about it, what burns in the fire? It's the needles. This is, this is a small percentage of the, the carbon. A lot of the carbon is in the bowl, in the roots, and so forth. So even after a wildfire that kills all the trees, you still have a lot of carbon left on the site. And then you have charcoal preserved. And charcoal is really resistant to erosion. Charcoal deposition over the course of millennia probably accounts for a substantial proportion of the total soil carbon pool in forests. Fire maintained ecosystems. So fire management processes that interfere with natural fire processes and eliminate the formation of this passive form of carbon storage. And our review reveals high carbon losses associated with fuel treatment. Only modest differences in the combustive losses associated with high severity fires and the low severity fire that fuel treatments are meant to encourage. We found little credible evidence that such evidence have the added benefit of increasing terrestrial stocks, that is doing prescribed burning and or uh, thinning. And here's from one uh, paper showing this is an old growth forest with carbon. Here's what happens after the wildfire and compared to the logging in this particular study. A lot less uh, carbon after the logging. And um, so not only does logging impoverish the forest ecosystem, the removal of wood from the forest has many, many uh, impacts. For example, genetics. Um, uh, one study that I'm aware of found that there was a 50% loss of genetic diversity uh, after there was a thinning project versus pre-thinning. And that's because a lot of the, there's, there's a lot of, even if you have 100 trees and you take out, say, 50 of them, uh, there's going to be rare alleles, maybe only one or two trees of that 50 that you took out have this genetic adaptation that might be an adaptation to tolerate drought or it might be resistant to insects or whatever. So you go in there and you take out those trees, you don't know which ones you're taking out. Um, for example, um, uh, there are genetic differences in the resistance to periodic product attacks. Not all trees are vulnerable to attack. And one of the things that's really interesting about some of this research, this is, was done on uh, lodgepole pine in Colorado, uh, they found that the, the same adaptation that helps resist bark beetles is also the same that is good for drought. So, uh, you know, it's, it has multiple uh, benefits. Um, genetic, resistant trees of both systems have significantly more resin ducts in recent growth than susceptible trees. And they found, and this is another study that was done in Montana on lodgepole pine that found that there were differences even within lodgepole pine sand. Some lodgepole pine grew better during cold, moist times, and some grew better during dry, hot times. And, and again, the trees all look the same when you look at them, but they have these genetic differences. And uh, part of it uh, uh, suggests that you have to be careful, assuming that you're having no impact when you log. 
You have another thing is weeds. This is the boundary of a logging project. Look at all the weeds that came in there. This is, this is an area burned behind there and has native vegetation came back. Where they did the salvage logging, it looks like that. Soil compaction, disturbance from logging. That's, you know, the compaction of the soil, all this debris that's uh, on the forest floor that's uh, broken up. Uh, logging roads also cause a lot of sediment. I, I don't know if it's as much of a problem around here, but in the Pacific Northwest, uh, it's a big, big deal because what happens is you have uh, the logging roads are there all the time. They don't go away usually. So they're a chronic source of sediment. You would say a fire creates sediment. It does, but it quickly, within three or four years, usually gets back to pre-fire conditions in most areas. And But the roads are there all the time. Plus you cut across the, uh, the subsurface flow right here. So water is subsurface, hits this open point, comes out, gets on the road, carries down sediment, and, and screws up the stream for uh, fish uh, spawning and, uh, and, and, and other impacts like that. So you have also wildlife habitat losses due to social avoidance and in Montana and, and uh, <coughs> Wyoming where we have uh, still have grizzly bears. Uh, it's found that grizzlies will avoid logging roads up to two miles on either side of the logging road. So you're talking about four miles of habitat on either side um, that they don't get to use, even if it's good habitat. Uh, then I'm just going to show you, I could, I'm going to give you some quotes here from a whole bunch of studies. I have a whole lot more I could refer to. I just want to give you a quick sample of a few. By our current standards, even our best fuel reductions do not appear to be adequate to provide much assistance in the control of high intensity wind driven fires. Again, that extreme fire weather. Extreme fire weather is overwhelm treatment. Environmental, extreme environmental conditions overwhelm most few treatment effects. This included almost all treatment methods, including prescribed burning and then Another review. Fuel treatments cannot realistically be expected to eliminate large areas burned in severe fire weather years. This, by the way, is a thin forest back in Montana that um, obviously was not, did not stop the fire. Okay, here's the Waldo Canyon area. This is pretty interesting stuff. I see this all the time. I was looking at pictures of the Santa Rosa fires. I saw the same thing up in Santa Rosa, California. And that is, you got green trees all around these houses. And there's not even any forest in sight. This is grassland over here. So we got hardly any, quote, fuels. We have a fuel break in the form of a road. And even with all that, we have all these houses that burned down. Why did they burn down? Because burning embers were blown over all miles ahead of the fire front and landed on houses that were flammable. And what this suggests is that reducing the flammability, this is what a lot of the uh, people that have looked at this, reducing the flammability of homes is your most effective and efficient way of protecting homes and communities. And in fact, if you're going to do any thinning or prescribed burning, it should be right around the homes in that area. It doesn't do you any good to do it miles away. It is the treatment of fuels immediate proximity to the resident and to the degree which the residential structures themselves can ignite that determines if the residents are vulnerable. And uh, strategic thinning starts with the home and works out. Uh, some of the work by uh, Jack Cohen found that uh, wooden walls at distances greater than 130 feet will not ignite. You get this pulse of heat comes through with a fire, even a, a, a high severity fire, and, and if there's nothing flammable around the house, most homes will survive that. Uh, you, you, that means having like metal roofs, having vents on uh, your vents screened, uh, uh, doing things like making sure you don't have a, a wooden deck that's got firewood on it and so forth. Uh, but if you take care of those uh, 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 flammable things, you, you're, you've got a good chance that you will survive the fire. So wildfires and other natural events improve and invigorate ecosystems. Healthy forest ecosystems are ones with abundant of natural events, including wildfire and beetles. Severe large wildfires and beetles provide the bulk of tree recruitment. Native wildlife is adapted and depend upon episodic events like wildfire. Thinning reduces carbon storage even compared to birth stance and the way to protect communities is reduce home flammability and zoning to prevent building in the fire plane. And I'll tell you, just when you drive around Santa Fe and you see all the houses poked out in the woods and, and the juniper and stuff, this is a disaster waiting to happen here. And the uh, uh, same with where I live in Bend, Oregon, where now I think we've got forests right up, national forest right to the edge of town. And, and I, I suspect that um, uh, we're going to have the right conditions for a fire that's going to blow embers and 
And one of the things you have to realize that if you don't have these uh, uh, mandated uh, uh, conditions that have to be met, that uh, like metal roofs or something like that, even if you do that on your house, let's say you get all the pine needles out of your gutter and stuff, if your neighbor isn't like that, your house could burn down because once the structure fire starts, structure fire puts out way more heat and more embers and so forth. And that's why you see the domino effect like I showed you in some of these pictures. Um, so that's the uh, you know thing that you have to do. Now, there can be thinning and, and some of that stuff can be done if it's done strategically at surgical points, you know, not just as a massive thing across the landscape. The other thing I want to point out is that uh, a, a further problem with a lot of the prescribed burning and thinning that I've seen, and I don't know what it is around here, but I've been to Oregon and Montana and stuff. Let's say they do prescribed burning. They, if they do it at all, they do it once. Well, within five years, the vegetation's come back. And sometimes it's more vigorous than before uh, in a lot of cases. So unless you continue that and indefinitely, forever and ever, you don't get an advantage. I mean, yeah, there's a chance of a fire happening next year, but the problem is you can't predict where fires are going to happen. And most thinning and uh, prescribed burning projects never encounter a fire. So <coughs> another reason why we need fires is to create habitat for forest elves. <laughs> They're very particular to the kind of habitat they're found in. Now, uh, I, this is my two kids that are grown up now. But, uh, we spent two summers traveling around the West looking at wildfires and stuff. And I was working on that one book. And uh, the, it's, it's, I overheard them talking to their friends when they got back to school in the fall. You know, friends were saying, well, what would you do? You know, oh, I went to summer camp and canoe, you know, and, and the other kids would say this or that. And my kids said, well, we just went around and looked at a bunch of dead trees. <laughs> no, thank you. Okay, that's all I'm going to go.